So tonight I am teaching on the, the topic of declaration, of declaring God's word um, and the power of his word or even just coming into agreement with what his word says, the power of it coming out of our mouths. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be a scripture, it just has to be a scriptural truth that you're speaking out and it agrees with his word. It doesn't have to be in the same verbiage as a specific scripture. First, though, I wanted to look at Ezekiel. <clears throat> if you can find Ezekiel in your Bible, it's um, just after Isaiah and Psalms and Proverbs. Um, this is a fundamental scripture, foundational scripture, a lot of people use to talk about intercessory prayer, but I haven't covered it yet, so I want to look at it. <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 30. Okay, so this is God speaking through the prophet Ezekiel, 22:30. It's very familiar. God's saying, I looked for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it. But I found no one. So I will pour out my wrath on them. That's what God said. Of course, that's Old Testament. You know, he's not pouring his wrath out anymore. He's all grace and love and mercy. <laughs> Unless you're not a believer, then you're living under wrath automatically, <laughs> unfortunately. <clears throat> but the principle is still true. He's still looking for someone among us who will build up the wall and stand before him in the gap to stop the, the will even of Satan, right? I mean, because... He's the God of this world. He's doing things. He's unleashed on the earth. He's tricking people into believing lies all the time. <clears throat> and God has put us on this earth as gap standers, as wall builders. <clears throat> One way we do that is by declaring the word of God and declaring statements in agreement with his word. So your job as an intercessor is to stand in the gap, to fill up, you know, pretend between, well, like these two things, there's a gap. This is a person, and this is, well, this is the person, and this is God, big. I'm going to stand in the gap between the two, and I'm going to make declarations. And as I declare things, and we're going to see the power of declaration, these, this gap is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller until I'm no longer needed, and I'm pushed out of the way. Now the gap is closed, and that person's saved, and they're in the kingdom. So our job is a really, really significant job to build up a wall of protection around people, to stand in the gap, to pull, to pull that person into God through our words, through our prayers. Um, you know, obviously you see how many, there's two, four, six, eight, nine of us, which is pretty big for a prayer meeting. <laughs> That's a lot of people. That's so sad. Why don't we have more people willing to come out and pray? Because we don't understand the power of it. And yeah, we're needed. We are so needed, and people don't know they're needed to stand in the gap, to build up the wall. I could probably spend all night on this scripture, but I've got so many others. <clears throat> Think about Abraham. You know, he's like, God, will you spare Sodom for 50 righteous people? What was he doing? Standing in the gap. Building up a wall. How about 40? <laughs> okay, I can't find 40. How about 30? You got 10? Can we find 10 righteous people? <laughs> You're there a little bit. Can I find 10? You know, I mean, Abraham is like, God, please. And God's totally like, sure. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, I'll do that. I mean, look at the character of God. He's like, you know, we're going to be here tonight declaring things, speaking things. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I like that. I'm agreeing with that. That's going to happen. That's going to happen. Yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Look at my kids. They're agreeing with me. They're, you know, stating truth. They're bringing things to pass. They're declaring. Oh, he loves it. He's just going to love us making declarations tonight. Okay, and then consider Jesus, our substitute. He's an intercessor. He ever lives to make intercession for you. He ever lives. Even now, in heaven, at the right hand of the Father, he ever lives. It's in Hebrews, you know. He already went to heaven. And, and the, the, um, the author of Hebrews said he ever lives at the right hand of the Father to make intercession, to stand in the gap. He's always there, you know, taking up that space to bring us together to God, just to always join us with him. That's what he lives to do. If that's Jesus' job, you know, what about us? Why don't we take it on? Let's do it. 
Okay, that's just about intercessory prayer in general. So now let's get into um, declarative prayer, <clears throat> making declarations. Just a few points about it, and then I'm going to get into some scriptures. <clears throat> when we declare God's word or statements in agreement with his heart, it brings a shift in the atmosphere of our region, our church, our family, an individual. It brings about a shift in the spirit realm. Because what we see here, all the physical stuff, is not as real as the spirit realm. But yet, the physical affects the spirit realm, and the spirit realm, we know, affects the physical realm. The, everything we see was created by something that you can't see. We'll go over that scripture. The spirit realm is actually more real than the physical realm. You know, when this is all destroyed and we're all in heaven and, you know, the end of the world comes, we'll be in the spirit forever and ever. This is temporary. The physical is temporary. So we need to learn how to live by the spirit, which is another topic. Point two about this. <clears throat> what you say today is creating your tomorrow. What you say today is creating your tomorrow. We were, Natalie and I were talking earlier before the prayer service, and I don't remember. Oh, we were talking about menopause, <laughs> which I am not in yet. <laughs> and I'm like, no, do not declare that over me. I've just been studying on declaring today, and I do not want to hear those words. <laughs> but think about how many times we say things that we shouldn't be saying. You know, I'm, just today I was somewhere, I was like at um, Home Depot or something, and somebody said, Oh, yeah, the guy was trying to find the plumbing, the right plumbing thing, and he said, well, since, since you're, you're with me, we probably won't be able to find it, you know, because I can never find things. He was, he was making a declaration over himself and his ability to do his job. Um, so, you know, we make these little statements or we have these little thoughts. We might not even speak them, but we think them. And we have to be able to identify, man, this is an unhealthy, unscriptural, unbiblical thought. This is not agreeing with the power of God and who I really am. And, and again, there's another topic we could go off on for many hours. Um, it's a huge topic we need to learn about, changing our thoughts, and how we view ourselves, how we view God, so we change our words, and because our words are forming our world. It's, it's huge. But when we declare in prayer tonight over our church, over our families, wherever God leads us to go, we are creating what's going to happen tomorrow in our world. <clears throat> so I would recommend if you're having trouble in your marriage or with your children, find some things or work, wherever. Um, find some scriptures and begin declaring them. Maybe not to their faces, maybe to their faces. I did that once with a relative of mine. Every time I saw that person, I would make statements to them like, you are a mighty person of God. I won't say, you know, male or female, but, and, um, you know, you are absolutely in love with God. And they just smile at me. <laughs> like, but they loved it. They loved it. You know, I was making faith statements, and they were listening, and it was going into their heart. And we need words like that. Okay, so third statement about declarative prayer. When you find yourself complaining about something, stop and ask yourself, what do I want? If I'm frustrated and unhappy about this thing, what is it? What's the antithesis of this thing? What's the opposite? I need to find a scripture and begin speaking that into existence. What don't you like about yourself? Find a scripture that gives you the opposite, that gives God's um, opinion or his purpose, his plan about you in that area or your life or your finances or your kids, your future, your destiny, whatever it is, and, and begin declaring those scriptures over yourself or over whoever it is. <clears throat> um, okay. Okay. Now, Proverbs 18, 21, um, we could go there, might as well. We won't go to every scripture. And this one is another very familiar scripture. Proverbs chapter 18, if we can get there quickly. I have a lot of scriptures to go to tonight. And verse 21, <clears throat> we've all heard it. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. In the Greek, the word power, I was expecting something like the Old Testament version of dunamis or something, you know, God's miracle working power, or I don't know, something. It means hand. Death and life are in the hand of the tongue. It's in the power of the tongue. Like your hand has the ability to grab something, pick it up, or drop it. 
so our tongue has that same force. It has a creative ability. My hand can take a, a pile of Play-Doh and shape it into the a shape of a duck, you know, or, or whatever I want to shape it into. So our tongues have creative ability. Death and life are in the hand or the power of our tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. You have no choice. You will eat <laughs> its fruit. And you are what you eat. You are what you eat. You become whatever nutrients you put in you, you become either healthy or sickly, depending on what you're putting inside your body. Um, another note I just thought of is the results of your words will be evident in your life. You will eat its fruit. Whatever is happening in life right now is evidence of your words, your thoughts. And, and it could just be that it's evidence that we haven't been speaking the right word. Maybe you haven't been speaking negative words. But if you're not speaking positive words, if you're not speaking the power of God in a positive sense, then that could be why you have this X, Y, and Z going on in your life. And you need to, you need to ramp it up a little bit. You, know? you need to grab a hold of some truth and begin declaring it over that situation when you're in prayer. Because life... There's life in the power of your tongue. You can bring life to a person. You can bring life to yourself. You know, people who aren't hungry and thirsty for God, all they have to do is start saying, I'm hungry for God. I'm thirsty for God. They might be thinking, really, I'm not, but that's what I want, so I'm going to start sowing seeds. I'm hungry for God. I am so thirsty for God. <sighs> and then they go on about their business, you know, but, but that's what they want, so they start speaking it, and eventually... It's going to come to pass. There's a hunger and a thirst that will well up and will drive them into the presence of God and invite God into their presence. <clears throat> okay, another scripture. You don't have to go there, but you can if you want. Job 22, 28. Now, this is the book of Job. I hesitate to use anything in the book of Job. And, you know, because there was so much weirdness being said by his friends, and they were just goofy and off their rockers, and they weren't walking with God, and... One of them was, and, and I'm not sure if this guy was or not. I don't know Job very well. But I keep hearing this scripture. Over the last year, I've heard people teach it. I've heard people use it. I've heard people say it. Somebody said it recently in our church. Just mention it to me in passing. You shall decree a thing, and it shall be established for you. Barb's quoting it as I say it. And light will shine on your ways. <clears throat> When people are brought low and you say, lift them up, then he will save the downcast. Mm, sounds like standing in the gap to me. If you decree a thing, it's going to be established. If you speak it out of your mouth with your heart of faith, not doubting, but believing that God's word is creative and it has power within it, then you're going to establish something. Now, you can't see it right away but eventually you'll see it and we're going to look at some scripture about that how immediately you might not see a manifestation of a change and you might doubt even but that's why we need the word of god instructing us and reminding us the words i speak are full of power and they're either full of life or they're full of death there's no neutral zone that proverbs 18 didn't say life death or neutrality you know or i don't know laying down on top of the grave but not dead <laughs> it's either life or death that we're speaking so we're either in agreement with God's word, with the words of our mouths, or we are not. It's one or the other, and it's very easy to figure it out if you know anything about God's word and his character. Um, another scripture you can turn to, you don't need to, it's not like really super important, and we've all heard it. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. <clears throat> it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, and God said, thank you, said, let there be light. And what happened? Oh, it stayed dark. And there was light, because God said something. He spoke light into existence. You are made in the image of God. You are to function like God functions. You're seated in heavenly places at the right hand of God, far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion and every name that can be named. You're seated there with Jesus. You're seated there in Christ. You have the power of God within you. If we speak God's word, it's like God himself speaking it into existence. When we take it in faith, 
and we speak it, we release it, things are happening in the spirit realm. We can't see them. We have to believe it by faith. But something is changing in your favor <laughs> or in someone else's favor. <laughs> ah, will he find someone who will stand in the gap and build up the wall? Will he find someone? So we have to answer that question. Will he find me standing in the gap and building up the wall? Or maybe another version says hedge, building up the hedge. He needs to find us. He needs to be able to. Okay, Isaiah which you'll find right after Psalms and Proverbs, my soon becoming my favorite book. It's so awesome. God speaks to me so much out of Isaiah. He'll speak something, Isaiah 55, sorry. He'll speak something into my spirit, and it's a scripture, and I'm like, I know that's a scripture, so I'll Google it, and Isaiah, it's always Isaiah, <laughs> or John. Okay, Isaiah 55, and verse 10, verses 10 and 11. <clears throat> For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and they don't return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout, and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so will my word be, which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. So just like rain comes down from heaven and waters the earth and things grow, when we speak God's words out of our mouths, it's just like that rain that comes down and makes things grow. That word is coming out, and it's making things grow. It's making things change. It's making things develop. There's a change happening. There's, the, you know, there's, there's an alteration of what would have been that now is different because you spoke those words. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. We have no choice. So let's choose our words and let's speak ones on purpose to get what we want, to get the results that we want. This is a tool he's given us and he expects us to use it. <clears throat> so he said it will not return to him empty, his word, when it goes out from our mouths, but it will accomplish what he desires and it will achieve the purpose for which he sent it. So whenever you begin to doubt, you need to remind yourself of this scripture. No, God said that it will accomplish what he desires, and it will achieve the purpose for which he sent it, and for which I'm sending it out into the airwaves. It will achieve. It will accomplish. If you begin to doubt, speak out your mouth. Nope, I spoke those words. It will achieve what, I, what God wants it to accomplish. It will bring forth fruit. It will produce a harvest. Because God said so, and my daddy doesn't lie. <laughs> My daddy doesn't lie. This is the truth. This is a bigger truth, a greater truth than, than all the, the truth I see around me. All the, the lies, really, that we think are truth that we see around us. We see somebody's life falling apart, but we're speaking the word. We're speaking the word over it. And that means in reality, in the spirit, things are changing. I just can't see the change yet. But it's happening, so I can't give up. If I stop watering... If I stop letting that water fall down from heaven and water the seed that I'm planting, that I have planted, well, what's going to happen to the seed? It dies. If I stop watering, it's going to dry up and die. So I can't stop watering. I have to keep speaking that word, keep releasing the word. Okay, Hebrews chapter 11. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3. And look up at me when you get to that scripture. So I know we have most people. Okay. Um, by faith we understand. That right there is another message all in itself. <laughs> you know. By faith, we understand things. There's a lot in the word of God you won't understand, but you can, can, you can take it in by faith, and your spirit gets it, and eventually your mind gets it. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. God spoke the world into existence. He created the world. He has creative power in his mouth. I'm made in his image. Say that. I'm made in his image. Yeah. So I have creative power in my mouth. Can you repeat that? So I have creative power in my mouth. <laughs> I'm not very good at that. Pastor Bob's so good at that. Okay, everybody say this after me. He's so good at it. No, I just miss everybody up. <laughs> All right. 
All right, so the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen, the chair, the table, the carpet, the drums, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. He created the world by speaking words. Those words were not visible things. They were not concrete. They were spirit. He spoke out spirit, and he created the physical. The spirit is superior to the physical. So when we join with God and we agree with him and we speak out words out of, out of a heart of faith, we are creating in the spirit that will appear in the physical. We are creating things. We are changing things. That word that we're speaking out has a creative force inside of it. It has the power of God. When we're in agreement and in faith, the power of God is contained in that word, those words. And they're going out. And, I, you know, obviously I can't explain how this works because only God knows. I don't, I don't know if anybody has some clue. <laughs> Tell me. But there's power in it, and it's going, and it's depositing wherever I'm sending it to, and it's bringing forth change. It's bringing, you know, you picture the rain, as Isaiah 55 said, coming down and causing things to grow. Picture a desert that now has rain and things are growing in the desert. So there's an oasis. That's change. That's from death to life. We bring change through the words that we speak. So I'm, I'm teaching this tonight so that when we begin declaring things, when we begin praying, you believe that the words you're speaking are full of power and bringing change. If we truly believe this every moment of our lives, we will really, really watch the things we speak. And I think we don't truly believe it, even after seeing scripture, because we don't see instantaneous change. If it was just, voila, and, you know, my cranberry juice turned into a rock, because I spoke, you know, turned into a rock, and it turned into a rock, well, then I'd have no doubt, right? There'd be no room for doubt, because there'd be evidence, physical evidence. But we walk by faith and not by sight. So we walk by faith in what God's word says, and we eventually see the change. So I'm sure, has anybody experienced that? Where you've believed God and you've spoken words over yourself and you've chosen to walk a certain path and you saw change over time? Has anybody had that experience? I hope somebody has. <laughs> Natalie, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I know I have. I mean, just in being desperate for God, you know, and seeking him and crying out and asking for wisdom and revelation. I'd go weeks and just every day, God, open my eyes, open my ears, open my eyes, open my ears, and then declaring, my eyes are open, my ears are open. And then he, like, I want to say he starts speaking. No, finally I tuned in, you know, I was able to start hearing because he was talking all along. And then download after download, well, it's because I kept asking. I kept speaking it out. I kept coming out of my heart and out of my mouth. And then the manifestation, boom, appeared. It started happening. So <clears throat> it works, I know from experience. A um, few notes I wrote down as I was studying. Our words influence the spirit realm, which ultimately impacts what we experience in the natural. Kind of already said that. Declarations are a major building material to frame the house of your life, your church, your family, our region. Declarations, declaring God's word, it's a major, major building material to frame everything, to put a framework together, to, to build something concrete in the natural. <clears throat> You don't have to turn here. Matthew 12, 37 says, By your words you'll be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned. Yeah. Our declarations will either restrict or bless our lives. By your words you'll be justified, or by your words you'll be condemned. We condemn ourselves. Condemn our families. We, for, we condemn our futures. We condemn our... Our, our callings, our destiny, by the words we speak. I'll never be able to do that. I, you know, I don't have what it takes. Um, I would just give up now. I just, nobody wants to listen to me. You know, I, I'll never get the money to go on that trip or to do this thing or words like that. Ah, it's condemning. You know, you know who we're agreeing with when we speak words like that or even just think those thoughts? Who are we agreeing with, Richard? <laughs> You're pointing down. I want to hear it. Under your feet, that, that dude who is under your feet, we're agreeing with him, and he's a defeated enemy. Why do we agree with him? 
Because we need to renew our minds. So listen to your words, and you'll discover the areas in which you need to renew your mind. You need to change your thoughts so that naturally what comes out of your mouth is always positive, is always, I am more than a conqueror. This is not going to stop me. This is not going to get me down. Okay, let's see. <clears throat> Romans chapter 4. Let's look at this one. This is an awesome, awesome one. Romans 4. <coughs> um, whole chapter and other chapters around it are about Abraham, the father of the faith. And hmm, we're going to start in verse 17. As it is written, I have made you, Abraham, a father of many nations. And then he starts speaking to us. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed. The God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not, or that which does not exist. He calls it into being. God calls things into being, things that don't exist, he calls them into existence. That's how God works. He is our role model. Jesus came to earth to show us the express will of the Father, right? Hebrews 11, no, Hebrews 1, early, verse 2 maybe, talks about Jesus being the express image of the Father, the um, perfect display of the Father's personality and will and, you know, how he functions, how he operates. And our job, it says in 1 John, is to walk just like Jesus walked to act just like Jesus, to be just like Jesus. It's in 1 John. We're supposed to be just like him. So God the Father is this way, and Jesus came to earth to reveal the Father to us, and he was this way. He called things into being that didn't exist, right? There's, there's somebody with a broken ankle or a withered hand. Oh, rise, be healed. Oh, that didn't exist before, and now it does, right? Dead person, mm, come back to life, stand up. Hug your mother. It, back to life. That didn't exist. Death is what existed. Now life exists because he spoke. All he did was speak. He spoke with a heart of authority. He knew who he was. He knew the Father's will because he was always in tune with the Father, which means who else can be always in tune with the Father? Raise your hand. Everybody raise your hand. Raise both. I can always be in tune with the Father. It's my choice. I can choose to be in tune with God, and I can choose to not be in tune with God. I just have to tune in. <laughs> I just have to think about him. And what was that? Oh, I was in Philadelphia last weekend, and I asked the Lord, hmm, Lord, what are you doing in this service today? Like, what are you doing among the people? And he showed me a picture of a pencil, and he said, I'm rewriting scripts. So it's like a script, like a play for your life, you know? I'm rewriting scripts. And it was this Latino church. So I was up there. I was going to be doing some speaking, and so before I went up and I asked if I could share that, and they were like, Wah! you know, these Hispanic ladies, they were going nuts. Yeah, I got a new script. It was so fun. <laughs> but that didn't exist before. And because they spoke that out, and whoever received it, well, now, whatever they thought their life was going to end up like, it can be different. Because if they received that word that God's rewriting my script, he's going to take me in a different direction. He's going to make give me a new life. He's going to, I thought I was going on a dead-end road, and now I'm on this super highway, you know, the heavenly good things on earth. Just because I believe what he says, and, and I speak it out of my mouth too, and I agree with it. So simple. This is one of the tools he gave us to change our world. So we need to do this on purpose. We need to choose to speak words of life. Look at the areas in your life. Look at the areas in our church that need to change, you know, where life needs to spring forth, where, where more power needs to flow from heaven to earth. And start declaring these things, not just on Wednesday night, but in your own prayer time at home. Just start speaking it out. And if you can't think of a scripture, then just say, in the name of Jesus, you know, tell, me, tell me something. Tell me something we need to be praying about in your life or somebody you know or the church. 
Okay, her daughter um, just overcoming some issues and becoming healthy. In the name of Jesus, I declare over Riley that she has perfect health, that God is working in her physical body, working in her soul, changing her thoughts, her mind, her emotions. Lord, I declare over her that she is choosing her thoughts, that she is hungry for you, God, and that she desires to change and to grow, and that your healing power is falling on her right now. And every second of the day, you are falling on her, and you're changing her thoughts and the way she views herself and the way she views you. I mean, you know, I didn't look up scripture, but it all agrees with scripture. It's all scriptural. Or I, or I could say other negative things. Oh, did you hear what's going on with Riley? You know, she's not in good health. She's struggling. Well, we do that all the time. Oh, did you hear about so-and-so? What good does it do? It does no good. It brings death. It brings death. And if we understand the power of our words, we wouldn't be saying those things. And I'm just as guilty as the next guy. But I've been working on it. And that's, that's what, what I expect, is let's start working on these things. And that's what God wants. Because <clears throat> you, you build a habit, you know, and you eventually have some change. You just have to start somewhere. Okay, so Romans 4.17, so good. The God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that did not exist. Ah, and then he goes on to talk about Abraham, who against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so he became the father of many nations. He's talking about something that didn't exist, that came into being in Abraham's life because he served this God who does supernatural things. It's a principle. He's trying to teach us. Have faith in me. Speak these words. You know, I changed Abram to Abraham exalted father to father of many nations because every time I address my son, I want him to hear in his ears, oh, father of many nations. Uh, I remember meeting these pastors over in the um, uh, middle of the state somewhere, and when we first met them, it was through some friends, we walked into their church, and they walked up to like the men in our group, and they put out their hands, and they said, well, hello, mighty man of God. What's your name, you know? <laughs> That's how they address each other in this church. I mean, who does that, right? Hello, mighty singer and psalmist for the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> hey, mighty prayer warrior, right? Hey, man of faith, how are you today? Awesome. Doesn't that put faith in your heart? Doesn't that draw some gold out of you? Doesn't that make you feel valuable? Hey, man who's going to the ends of the uttermost ends of the earth to save souls and heal bodies and destroy the works of the devil. Oh, oh, that's good. See, we don't hear that kind of stuff enough. But if we start saying it, we're going to sow seeds, and maybe other people will start doing it too within your family or you know, wherever, whoever you associate with, maybe they hear it because it's like, oh, that feels so good. I like that. Yeah. That's what God says to you. Tune into what he says. One day, uh, some of you have heard this so many times, but it was so profound for me. I heard the word diadem in my spirit. I was in prayer. I was just worshiping God, and I just out of the blue heard the word diadem, and I'm like, what in the world is a diadem? I don't know. <laughs> Multifaceted something, dia. Anyways, I Googled it. And it was a scripture. Of course, it was in Isaiah, which says, You are a crown of glory in the Lord's hand, or you're a crown of glory, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. Ah, oh, that's how he sees me. <laughs> I'm a crown of glory in my papa's hand. And he just like, oh, he looks at me and I'm beautiful to him. And, you know, and then there was another time he gave me another scripture. And you've probably heard it. It's, um, he, don't call yourself desolate anymore. Call yourself Hepzibah. My delight is in her. My delight is in you. Giving us a new name. You can claim that one. My new name is Hepzibah. I don't like that as much as his delight is in me. Hepzibah is not that great, but... His delight is in me. Oh, my goodness, that is good. I like that. His delight, because his delight is in you. His delight is in you. He loves you. He loves looking at you. He loves hearing from you. He loves, and in, in the Song of Solomon, your worshipful voice. When you turn your voice of worship towards him, it says that he is undone 
what, by your worshiping eyes and your heart of worship towards him. He is undone. He's like, oh, it melts God. <laughs> when we worship him and we just look at him and we love him, he melts. I mean, doesn't that do something to you? Does that do anything to you? It does something to me. <laughs> it's so good. God is so good. All right, First Peter 3.10. He who would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. So it's not just about not speaking the negative, but it's also about speaking the truth, the positive. Keep your tongue from evil, which means don't speak evil, speak the truth. And not just what is true. You might see something that's true about me, but what's the truth? You know, I might, I might have a friend who it's true that Mm, he's a procrastinator, always puts things off, and never, never does things on time, never shows up on time. That's true. It's very true. However, what's the truth? What does God say about that person? God says, what does God say? What would a scripture be about that? That person is um, like aware and present in the reality and excellent, a, a, a man of excellence, a person of excellence and um, responsible. And, you know, I'm sure I could easily find scriptures about that. You Google scriptures about responsibility. <laughs> the internet's awesome. Um, so that's what, that's the truth. There's a lot of things that are true, but what's the truth? What is, the truth will set you free, not what is true. There's a lot of true stuff that we see with our eyes that does not agree with the truth of God's word, that is superior to what we see as true. Because people will say, well, it's true. I'm sick. Well, sure, you can't deny it. You're, it's, it's true. It's very true. You know, maybe you're sick. But what's the truth? The truth is higher. That Jesus carried your sickness. He bore those diseases in his body to free you from it. He was your substitute. He took your place. That's the truth. That's a higher reality than the tr this true thing that says, I, I, I'm sick. I feel sick. I have these symptoms. The truth will set you free, not what's true. <clears throat> I just have two more scriptures here. Okay, let's look at Mark chapter 11. <clears throat> Mark 11 and verse 12. Because <clears throat> here's a perfect example of speaking something in the natural and not seeing a change right away. Mark eleven twelve. 12. The next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs, which is an interesting point. Then he said to the tree, who, what did he speak to? The tree. Everybody say the tree. The tree. He spoke to the tree. Everybody repeat after me. He spoke to the tree. Are you willing to speak to the tree? <laughs> and to the mountain. <laughs> oh, where am I at? Okay, and what he said was, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. So he cursed it, and his disciples heard him say it. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts. Now let's jump down um, to verse 19, because they went into the temple. You know, he tipped over the tables. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. So when he said it, does it say they saw any change? No. No change. They just heard him say it, and they were like, whoa, Jesus, why are you talking to a tree? And it's not even the season for figs. That's not fair. But he was teaching a kingdom principle, which I've heard different teachings on, and it's awesome. But um, stay on point. The next morning, they saw it withered from what? The roots. Everybody say the roots. The roots. The roots. So it started <laughs> in a place that was hidden. It began underground in the roots. When we're speaking to a problem, when we're speaking to something that, that requires change, it's starting from the roots. So whatever the root of the problem is, there is change coming. Whatever that root, even if you don't know what the root is in the problem, there is change coming. He just cursed it. He just said die, basically. Don't ever produce fruit again. That means in his heart he meant die, and the thing knew what he meant. 
It was contained faith, and he spoke it out. From the roots, it began withering and dying, but you couldn't see any evidence above the ground. So let's say you're declaring things over your children or, or you know, over some family member, and you're just not seeing any behavioral change. They are not changing. Well, from the roots, they are, because you're speaking in faith. From the roots, there is change. Their roots now are pulling up something different, and it's going to come up into their life and be exposed and presented in public eventually. It took, actually, this looks like one day, but I read a commentary that says it took two days. So in the morning they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots, and Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And what did Jesus say? Have faith in God. And I know from over the years being in faith churches, it means have the faith of God, because God's the one who gives us faith. We exercise it and it grows, but he, it comes from God. Faith comes from God. Have faith from God. Have the faith of God. Walk in God's faith. Just exercise what you have. And he's saying, just trust God. Believe him. And then he goes on to t talk about talking to things. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and you don't doubt in your heart, but you believe that what you say will happen, it'll happen. It'll be done for them. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And then forgive people when you stand praying. So he's saying, when I cursed that fig tree two days ago, guys, that's all I did was I believed in my heart that what I said out of my mouth would happen. I just believed it. Why could he believe it? How could he believe it? Whoa, where, you know, where is this, this thing where you cross over the line and you're like Jesus and you believe what you say is going to come to pass or you're like other people and you don't believe it and nothing happens? Where is that line? And I had it in my head, and now I can't remember what I was going to say. <laughs> Exercising your faith. I don't know. Dang. <laughs> I had it. I had a good answer for that. I, there, here's where the line is. Um, I don't know. Oh, Jesus, it'll come back. <laughs> so pick something in your life. Ask the Lord and, and pick something and start speaking to it. Just focus on it. Just focus on that one thing. And it took time. Last week, we talked about shameless persistence, knocking on the door. And I need to borrow some bread. You know, I got a neighbor or a friend who's come, and I need bread. And, and the guy's like, no. Well, he'll open the door if you are shamelessly persistent. You keep chasing after it. And I need this. I need this. And it's not that we have to beg from God. He's just saying, be persistent. Keep asking and keep seeking and keep knocking. And don't give up. Don't give up. Don't quit. So we, I won't make you go here because we're running out of time. But John eleven thirty three, 33, Jesus, Lazar, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Does anybody remember what he did to raise him from the dead? Yes, it says, in a loud voice, Jesus said, Lazarus, come out or come forth, depending on your translation. He, he spoke what he wanted to see happen. He didn't even speak life. He just said, he knew, I guess. If he comes out, he's going to be alive. So, and that was the faith in his heart. Lazarus, come forth. And he came out all wrapped up in his grave clothes. <laughs> he did, because Jesus believed what he was saying would come to pass. He believed that it would happen. So we need to have the faith of God, believe there's faith deposited in our hearts, and begin just speaking whatever it is that is in agreement with his word.